So tonight, um, we're gonna, I'm going to kind of continue. I'm going to do a standalone message. I'm going to kind of continue in the vein of teaching and Bible study that we've been in. We're going to be doing a standalone message from the book of Jude that I've entitled, Hey Jude. And so I know a lot of people may feel this way, but growing up, I kind of felt like I was born in the wrong decade, right? I was born, Pastor Jason made fun of me when I mentioned this a few weeks ago. I was born in 89, so I grew up, look at y'all making fun of me again. Uh, I was born in 89, so I lived through the 90s and the early 2000s. And you guys may disagree with me, but I think it was a pretty good era for music. All right, here's why. Some of the great bands, U2, Red Hot Chili Peppers, Elton John. You get the boy bands, NSYNC, Boys to Men, Backstreet Boys. If you're into the divas, this was the time Mariah Carey, Celine Dion, and the all-time greatest, Whitney Houston. In country music, you got George Strait, Riv McIntyre, Tim McGraw. Hip-hop was on the scene. MTV was booming. Pop music, because we know it now, really uh, happened in the 90s. It was a good era for music. But I was raised on a music of a different time. My dad raised me on the music of his era. So I was raised on classic rock and southern rock from the 60s and 70s. Fleetwood Mac, Credence, look at y'all, don't be getting unholy in church, all right? I'll just say it and you can just nod your head. Credence, Clearwater Revival, The Eagles, Queen, Leonard Skinner, those were the soundtracks of my childhood, right? I drew, I drove, my dad drove me to school every morning and these bands and these this music was just kind of like etched into uh, my memory nostalgia for me has to be the best with the Almond Brothers I moved here from Macon which is where the Almond Brothers were, were from and um, so I just kind of love this time of this time of music and Again, it's not even the music that makes me think I was born in the wrong decade. You're about to make fun of me, but all throughout high school and college and even my early ministry career, I had an afro that would make anyone in the 70s proud. I think there's some pictures. Are they there? Look at there. I had a serious fro, y'all. And, so <laughs> and so tonight we're going to be looking into the book of Jude. And if you're like me, you probably can't help but being a little nostalgic and thinking about the Beatles chart, chart topper, Hey Jude. If you're really observant, you'll even notice they added the green apples because on their vinyl they had the green apple, right? And since, like for the past two days, I've just been walking around humming, na, 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 na. So maybe that'll be, uh, when, I, when I sent my notes to Jill today, she was like, I have been humming the na-na's all day long since you sent that to me. Anyways, that's just a fun little opener. But if you've been here for the last uh, month or so, you know that we've learned some really uh, good information about studying scripture. One of the things that we learned is that context is the most important part of reading scripture. And we talked about this, I don't mean to be a dead horse, but if you're new here tonight, uh, it's, 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 it's worth repeating. I think a vast majority of American Christians treat the scriptures as this big collection of fortune cookie like papers, right? They just want to reach in, grab something out that feels inspirational, let it get them through the day. But like we learned about in our last series, Bible for Grown Ups, understanding the Bible takes work and it's a lot more than that. There's probably one book of the Bible, which is Proverbs, that you can just kind of pull little pieces out and take that kind of um, fortune cookie approach to reading the Bible. The rest of the Bible requires study and exegesis. So we're going to get in tonight's, into tonight's message. I hope that you grab notes uh, as you walked in because there is uh, the book. We're going through the entire book of Jude, which don't get nervous. It's only 25 verses. And um, there's, but there's a lot happening in the verse, in the, in the book of Jude. So we're going to talk about what's going on here. So Jude whose real name was not Jude. It was some, some scholars say Judah or some say Judas. And then uh, because they didn't, they wanted him to be confused with Judas Iscariot, it was just turned to Jude, who was one of the, they were one of the four brothers of Jesus. Check this out. Fun fact, none of Jesus's four brothers 
believed that he was the Messiah until he resurrected from the dead. I think that is nuts. Okay, here, like, let's just, this isn't even the point of the message. We're just talking about the author of this book. But can we talk about this is that Mary and Joseph, so we know that Jesus was conceived through Mary by the Holy Spirit. So his brothers were his half brothers, but still these four men grew up in a home where they heard their mother and father talk about the immaculate conception, where they heard their father and mother talk about the fact that he was born and there was a star and shepherds came and wise men came. They were literally there and they had a front row view to the miracles and all the things that were happening and they still did not believe that he was the Messiah. That really just blows my mind. And so it's really easy, it's really easy to breeze past this. But, uh, and I, and I, don't, I don't want to stay here and preach here, but I just want to give us kind of just one little quick nugget of encouragement today. That if you let your purpose be determined by the people closest to you, then you may be really let down. Jesus lived his adult life and his brothers, his half-brothers, didn't even believe in who he was. So I just want to tell you this. If you've got a God-given purpose and a calling, pursue it even if the people closest to you in life don't recognize it. Amen? So all four of, of Jesus' brothers, they were convinced after his resurrection. Why is this? Because they saw him die on the cross. And then they saw him and they heard the witness accounts afterwards. So it's after his resurrection that they're like, whoa, our brother that we thought was just really off of his rocker and our parents that we thought may have had this delusional moment, maybe all of this is true because no one raises from the dead, right? So all four of his brothers, they were convinced and then they devoted their lives to convincing the Jews that their brother Jesus was the promised Messiah. But Judah, we'll call him Jude just to keep things easy tonight. I won't keep you running around all the names, so we'll just call him Jude. Jude actually dedicated his life to be a traveling evangelist to Jewish communities. So his other, other three brothers, they kind of stayed put where they were. Jude hits the road, and he's like, man, I have got to convince my other Jewish uh, fellow believers that they're the Messiah has come and he was actually my brother and his name is Jesus and so Jude would go from one Jewish community to the next telling him that the Messiah that they were looking for had come and they would tell him about Je to tell them about Jesus Jude is written to a particular Jewish community and is a warning to watch out for false teaching in their community that's the purpose of the book Check this out, though. Because he writes to a Jewish audience, he assumes a deep level of knowledge for three things. For Hebrew scripture, for non-scriptural writings of the faith, and Jewish traditions. And here's the deal with this. Jude's not the most popular book in the Bible that we preach out of because, uh, because we're not Jews, because we don't know Jewish traditions, because we don't know Jewish non-scriptural text we're to disadvantage as readers. That's why, again, using proper hermeneutics like we talked about is so important. So it doesn't give us all the answers, but it lets us know where to start asking questions. It tells us even though this is a short book, we can slow down and ask questions to get through it. So you'll see in your notes, and again, I hope, I hope we made this in a way that, that you can follow with me. Uh, Jude is writing this letter to a Jewish community, and he breaks his letter down into three distinct sections. Number one, opening remarks, that's verses one through four. Number two, he makes accusations against corrupt leaders in verses five through 19. This is the, the, the chunk of what he's writing about. And then the last five verses, he has his closing charge. So we're going to dive into section one which is opening remarks. We're going to read this beginning in verse 3. It says this, Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you, for you to contend for the faith. Everyone say that. Say contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. That was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation. Ungodly people 
listen to this, who pervert the grace of our Lord God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So in this opening, what he's saying is like, hey guys, I wanted to write to you for one reason. I wanted to to write to you about our common salvation, but I'm actually noticing a problem. And this problem is so urgent that I'm having to take my original intent from writing this letter and put it to the side. Now I'm having to write to you about a separate issue. And he tells them the major call to action is to contend for the faith. So the ancient Greek word translated contend, it comes from two parts. It comes from an athletic word from the wrestling mat. And then it is strengthened from the word meaning to agonize. So we're wrestling and we're agonizing when we contend. And then there's the concept of the faith. And here's what the faith is. The faith is the essential truths of the gospel that all Christians hold in common. Again, if you're here for Bible for Grown Ups, Pastor Jason described that word as dogma. Remember that vocabulary word that we learned? So when we contend, we are wrestling and agonizing to hold to the essential truths of the gospel that we believe. And we contend for the faith because it is valuable. Here's what I, here's what, I want you to imagine something. Imagine... Like we're in, I don't know, New York or Paris, because those seem like artsy-fartsy cities, right? And we all walk into this big giant room, and it's well lit, and it's white everywhere, and there's these paintings all over the walls. You can't tell now these days if something is from Target or if it's worth $18 million, right? I mean, like art is so nuts. Let's be real. But here's how you would know if art was worth something or if it wasn't worth something. If you walked into an art museum of a very famous artist, if they've got an original Picasso on the wall, can I tell you what will be there? Guards. Someone will be guarding over valuable art. Here's just the basic premise why. This isn't life changing. We all know this. We guard what is valuable. We contend for things that are valuable in our life. When things are worthless, we don't guard them or we don't contend for them. And so what here Jude is telling us is that because our faith, and faith here is not what we believe, but it's the things that we hold in common as Christians, because these these ideals and these things that we believe are so important, we should contend for them. We should agonize over them. We should defend them. And much like the first century church, I think that we have found a lot of parallels where we can become lazy in our faith. And then when it, terms, when it comes time to defend it, we can become very cowardice in defending it. And so Jude's warning to this specific Jewish community in the first century, it screams to us today just like it did back then. Contend for your faith Be diligent to defend it from being corrupted by false teaching. That is what Jude is all about. And here's the deal. The false teaching that was infiltrating this particular community was a teaching that God's grace somehow uh, overlooked or allowed unholy living. The people in the faith community and those living in it were living well below the standard of holiness that God requires. Which moves us now into section two of his letter, which is uh, the accusation against corrupt leaders. We see this in verses five through 19. So in the opening verses, he challenges the readers to contend for the faith among their communities. In the second portion, Jude warns the audience in three ways of the dangers of false teaching and false teachers. I hope that you have your notes because you're going to see this. There's three warnings But then there's three descriptors or three examples inside the three warnings. So there's really like nine examples. So I don't want you to hope you'll follow along with me that inside the first warning, there are three examples. Inside the second warning, there's three examples. Okay. So in this time period, like we just talked about, there was this hyper fixation on some attributes of God while neglecting others. 
There was this, there was this the idea that they fixated on that God was an all-forgiving God, which is true, but it led way for corrupt teachers to deceive their way into the church. And an improper understanding of all the facets of God's nature, they leave us with a limited understanding of who God is, and therefore we diminish him. And I just want to say this. I believe that when when I'm studying the culture in the book of Jude, man, it's a reflection of the American church, of the Western church, maybe even just the modern church, regardless of where it is. part, Part of the beauty of a diamond or a precious gemstone is its facets. The facets are the individual cuts that cause the reflection and the fires of green and red and yellow and blue when you when you spin a diamond around, it's almost like a, a multifaceted diamond. The more facets that it has in it, the more that it shines. And I just want to tell you that uh, we can't oversimplify the attributes of God. God is multifaceted. He is a God of love, absolutely. But he's also a God of judgment. He is a God of, of grace, but he also is a God that calls us to holiness, And when we come to the place like this faith community was in the book of Jude, when they only look at one facet of who God is, what they're actually doing is they're diminishing God to one piece that they can maybe control or that they can understand. And when we do that, our entire theology of who God is is skewed. So what Job does is he gives them an example in this hyperfixiated culture of grace. Job, uh, I keep saying Job. I mean to say Jude. If I say James or Job, it's just my mind being crazy. The J biblical names. I mean to say Jude. Follow along with me, okay? So Jude takes a moment and he says, "Hey, all of you Jewish people, you are so uh, hyperfixated on God's grace. Have you forgot that He's also a God of judgment?" And so he gives them three biblical examples. And he tells them, this is in verses 5 through 7, he tells them that the God who saved the Israelites out of Egypt also judged those who didn't believe and they didn't enter the promised land. He tells them that God judged the angels who disobeyed and gave them eternal judgment. And that God judged Sodom and Gomorrah, the evil city. And now to us, these may seem a little random as Americans and Westerners, but this, again, understanding who this was written to. This was written to a Jewish audience who knew the Torah, who knew uh, their extra Jewish writings. One of these, for example, would be the book of Enoch, which is where point two comes out of, and then their traditions. All of these things are making perfect sense to them. Here's why. is the story of the Israelites reminded them that God punish, punishes rebellion against his authority. Number two, the story of the angels reminds them that God punishes And judges pride. And then number three, the story of Sodom and Gomorrah reminds them that God punishes sexual immorality and wickedness. And so Jude challenges the false teachers who are outwardly living in this sin and they just claim that grace covers unrepentant sin by reminding them that yes, God is a God of grace, but he's also a God of judgment. He's saying, hey, there's multifacets of who God is. And then in verse 11, he gives them another group of three examples. This time, the uh, examples are groups of rebellious leaders who then corrupted others. Jude reminds them that tolerating rebellious leaders and teaching will corrupt them. It's not in the Bible, but I can remember my mama the whole time I was raised saying, if you lay down with the dogs, you'll get fleas. And so Jude's saying, hey, listen, if you allow false teaching among you, it will also corrupt you. So he gives three examples. Cain murdered his brother and then built a wicked city, which then caused pain to the, to the people of Israel. Balaam, he couldn't curse Israel, so therefore he lured them into idolatry which is in Numbers 22 through 25. Korah, this is a Levite who led a rebellion against Moses, but it ended up in, ending tragically for all those who followed Korah, and they all died. That's in Numbers 16. So he has this warning for corrupt leaders who were tolerated. And he says, hey, if you tolerate corrupt leaders, if you yourself would say that, well, I'm not corrupt, but if you tolerate corrupt leaders and corrupt teachings, 
it will also affect you. You will be, uh, you, you will be affected by it. He concludes the middle section by warning against these false teachers. He says this in verse 12. They are shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept among by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead, uprooted. That's pretty intense right there. Wild waves of the sea, casting up the foam of their own shame, wandering stars whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. So here, what is Judah doing? He is now describing what these false teachers are like. I love this. I put these references in your notes, I believe. I want to really even challenge you this week. Um, He he describes them in three ways. They're like selfish shepherds, which is a tie directly back to Ezekiel chapter 34. Man, this week, I would love for you to go in your Bible and read Ezekiel 34 and, 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 and look at what the attribute is of a false teacher. It, it literally talks about these false teachers. They kill the fattened lambs for themselves. They're selfish leaders. Number two, he says they're clouds with no rain. Proverbs 25, 14. What's a cloud with no rain? It's worthless. Chaotic waves described in Isaiah 57, 20. And then he goes on to to describe to them in the next sections in verses 14 through 22. He says, hey, listen, you community, these warnings are nothing new. Like this isn't news fresh off the press. There has been warnings that have been coming to everyone that false teachers are trying to come into into our faith communities. What's he saying? He's saying the plan of the enemy is to send false doctrine and false teachers into the house of God. He's literally calling it out right here. And he even goes back, and again, we understand that he's writing to a Jewish audience. He's referencing non-biblical text, but Jewish text. Uh, So anyways, he's referencing the book of Enoch when he says this. He warned against false teachers, and he says this in verse 16. They are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. That's an old reference of what these false teachers would be. And then he quotes the apostles. And he says that warning has come from our fellow leaders about false doctrines. So he's saying literally Jesus' apostles, they have said this. And he quotes them in verse 18. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is these who cause divisions, worldly people devoid of the spirit. I I, I just want to remind you, he's not talking about people in the streets. He's talking about people that have slipped into the faith community that he's called to. Man, how um, sobering is that message? And what a warning and we see here that, that, that Jude is laying out a case as any expert lawyer would. He's giving them examples. He's walking them through, uh, referencing scriptures of their past, referencing their traditions to bring them along to understand this is a serious matter. You have to contend for the faith. You have to contend for the faith. You have to agonize. You have to wrestle. You have to defend for the things that we all hold in common because there are people, I want to say in Proverbs, it says wolves in sheep's clothing who want to come in and to deceive us. These false teachers have have made people think that they can do what they want, but Jude warns that while God is a God of grace, He's also a God of judgment. And the first set of examples show us that God is still a God of judgment. The second set of examples show us what can happen to a community when they allow a false teacher to corrupt them. And the third example shows us what type of people these people are and what type of judgment will come upon them. So Jude has created this beacon of warning that undoubtedly everyone in his time would understand. 
Now, I just want to tell you, to be honest with you, if we had just opened the book of Judah and we had just read everything on the screen, you probably wouldn't understand how clear this warning is and all the pieces that he's moving and all the things that he's doing to show them that this is a very real danger that they have to be on guard for that's happening in their community. And again, what's happening in their community is what's happening to us today. This concept that, that God is such a God of love that somehow he's not a God of a standard of holiness. Man, and it's become so old school and so not cool and so not in style for us to talk about God and see that he has expectations for us who follow him. Now, I, I want to I say this. Does God have expectations for those who don't follow him? No. He tells them, come, I'll make you new, I'll restore you, I'll transform you. But all of us who are in Christ, we still have new mercies every day. Thank the Lord. I still need my new mercies every morning and every day. But I should be on a process, you should be on a process of sanctification. Sanctification is an old school word, right? It's this concept of being set apart, being made more like Jesus every single day, that every day that I wake up and I look in the mirror, I look a little bit more like Jesus and a little bit less like the world. Uh, there, when I was in Bible college, we learned, when we studied this whole concept of sanctification, we learned the, the concept already but not yet. At the point of salvation, I am sanctified. I am made right. I am in right standing of God. But am I perfect? Don't ask my wife for that answer. You're perfect, babe. But every day the Lord calls me on a journey. And there are some days I'm telling you that I just feel like I'm so close to my relationship with God. It's like, man, I've made 15 steps in my journey today. And there are some days that I just mess up and I feel like I've fallen five steps back. And it's on those days that I thank the Lord for his mercy and grace, not as an excuse to continue living that way, but as his grace draws me back back to his holiness. And so there's this false teaching that's happening in the first century. There's this false teaching that's happening in our culture today that just says, oh, God loves us. Oh, God forgives us. And I'm not saying that God doesn't love us or God doesn't forgive us. Hear me. But I am saying that God is calling us and he's drawing us closer still, nearer still, to pick up some disciplines. Your walk with the Lord should not look like it did last year. If you have not progressed in disciplines, if you have not progressed, progressed in godliness, if you are not demonstrating more fruits of the Spirit in your life of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, if those things aren't becoming more and more evident in your life, then there's a problem. And here's what I'm saying. I'm not even saying that there's a certain pace that we all should be, that we all should be walking our journey at the same pace. You know what I'm hoping? I'm hoping for all of you who are seasoned saints, that you've been in this race with the Lord for a long time. You've read your Bible back and forth more than all of us. I hope that your pace is faster than mine. I hope that you have walked through so many things with the Lord that when he speaks to you, you don't have a hesitation of doubt anymore because you've seen his faithfulness yesterday. You've seen his faithfulness in the year 2000. You've seen his faithfulness in the year 1970. And so now after 40 years of following, you're running at such a hard and fast pace that it inspires me. And you know what? I hope that I'm running at a faster pace than someone who got saved yesterday. But here's what I should also do. I shouldn't cast judgment on those that are running at a slower pace than me. 
I should be setting an example to them to say, come on, brother, we're heading in this direction towards Jesus. Follow me as I follow Christ. He's the perfecter of my faith. I'm heading to an eventual goal that doesn't just sit here in the same sin and in the same mire and in the same muck and just need grace and need confession and need forgiveness of the same thing over and over and over again. God is calling me to a progression of sanctification that's the gospel the gospel is not a, a, a picture of grace that keeps you where you are the gospel is a picture of grace that draws you nearer to him every day and so here's what I want to tell you tonight is if you have been in a place where maybe you have told yourself it's okay that you're not progressing then maybe you've bought into the false teaching. And it's not new teaching. It's been around a really long time. This teaching that tries to abuse the grace of God as a reason to not grow closer to him. But God is calling you to a progressively deeper and deeper relationship with him calling you to holiness, calling you to sanctification, calling you to be a city on a hill, a light that shines before men, holy, set apart, pleasing unto him to be in the world, but not of the world. This is what God has called us to, not to a place of stagnation, but a place of movement. And so what's so beautiful about that is as a church, we should all be heading in the same direction. Like I said, not casting judgment on those that are walking slow, but saying, look at you go, you're making it. Come on with me. You may have fallen down, but I'm gonna pick you up because we're moving that way. That is what the community of God is all about, progressing towards Christ, not falling back and using grace as a crutch to stay where we are. But this is the culture that Jude is writing to, and it's the culture that we live in today. And in the last section, verses 20 through 25, I need to go quick. He has his closing charge. I just want to say this, too many times we can become fully aware of what we're not supposed to do and miss what we're supposed to do, right? This is an entrapment of legalism and religiosity. And here's what I want to say. I, I don't want to just because I have the mic take a moment to bash this because uh, I don't think anyone picks up and chooses legalism and religiosity. I don't think anyone says, well, this is the badge I want to wear today to be a staunch religious person. I don't think anyone has that motive in their heart. But it can be very difficult to follow a God who seems intangible. Like he's this God in heaven and he loves us. We know him. We can feel him. We can see the results of what he's done, but we can't see him or touch him, right? So there's so many aspects of God that are intangible. And so in trying to pursue an intangible God, we as, as just flawed humans try to set these systems up to do that. And we set these, ten, these tangible rules and systems up as a way to kind of measure ourselves that we're actually following God. And then we just get stuck in this rut of religiosity. But Jude ends his short letter with a closing charge. And it's not about what we shouldn't do, but it's about what we should do. And there's, there's these three points that he gives us. And the first charge is this, is take a look inward. It says this in verse 20. But you, beloved, building yourselves up in the most holy faith and praying in the spirits, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Four quick points from that. Number one, build yourself up in the faith. You know what this means is that you and I are responsible for our own spiritual growth. We're not in kids' church anymore. You have a responsibility to feed yourself. We come in here on Sundays. 
we are celebrating. These are pep rallies to encourage each other. But if this is the only thing you're getting, you've got to learn how to feed yourself. It means that we can't wait for spiritual growth to just happen, and we can't expect for others to make us grow spiritually. Number two from that passage in verse 20 through 21, he says, pray in the Spirit. We should battle against wrong living and wrong teaching. The battle against wrong teaching and wrong living is a spiritual battle requiring prayer in the Spirit. When we pray in the Spirit, we are praying above our own knowledge, but we're praying the perfect will of God over us. Number three, keep yourselves in the love of God. Keeping ourselves in the love of God means to keep yourself in harmony with God's ever-present love. The last thing we should do is wait on the mercy of our Lord Jesus. This is so simple, and this is something that, man, I think that we have lost sight of. We have to, as Christians, keep our eyes on the prize. What is the prize? It's understanding that my reward is not here on earth, but it is in heaven. I am not a citizen of this earth. I am a citizen of heaven. You know what Paul says? Paul says, while I'm here, I'm supposed to be an alien. I'm supposed to be so weird. I'm supposed to live so different that I stand out as an alien. Like that I'm this big gray head with an antenna popping on the top of my head. When people would see me, they're like, hey, what's up with him? Why is he so different? Because my eyes are not on earthly pleasures, but on a heavenly reward. So that's what it means to look inward. But after we look inward, we must look outward. Step number two. Verse 22 says this, have mercy on those who doubt. Everyone said together, have mercy on those who doubt. Verse 23, save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others, show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Number one, have mercy on those who doubt. This, mean, this means we should continue to love outsiders. No matter how bad a person is, no matter how misleading or terrible their doctrine, we are not allowed to hate them. Jude literally says to the false teachers who are spreading all of this bad doctrine among you, have mercy on them. The last point here is save other people. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. Out of the fire, and this is a straight-up call to evangelism, because we understand that people who don't accept the free gift of Jesus will face eternal punishment. So we have a charge to to get other people into a saving knowledge of who Jesus is. So after we look inward, then we look outward. Lastly. We have to look upward. There's a serious deception in the world, and that deception creeps into the church. I don't even want to get into um, hot topics right now because I've only got a few minutes left, and we don't have time for that. But we can see really, really quickly that our society as a whole is at a crossroads of determining moral grounds. Like things that we have seen as wrong for like the entire time that the human race has existed, suddenly in 2024, we're questioning if it's actually wrong anymore. We're getting to a place inside the church where church leaders and other denominations are beginning to ask themselves the question of centuries-old orthodoxy, things that we have always held to and said, this is God's standard, this is God's way, this is God's plan. Now the church, the modern church is at a crossroads saying, do we really want to go with this now? Or are we going to lean into culture who's telling us that tolerance is actually the best way to show love. And 
this deception that's around us, it is so real. I tell you that, unfortunately, a lot of times I see Christians respond in anger, which I think is probably rooted in fear. And again, let me just be honest with you. I've got four kids under the age of seven. If you didn't know that, welcome to my life. I have a great fear about the society that they'll be raised in. Like, it's scary for me to think about what the society around them is going to tell them the manhood should be. And so what can I do? I can let that fear. I, I tell my kids this all the time. We cannot control our emotions, right? And every emotion that you have is valid. But it's what you choose to do with that emotion. That's where the problem lies. So I think we look at our culture. We look at deception. We look at things creeping into the church. We have fear. Is that fear allowed? Yes. You are entitled to every emotion that you feel. I feel like a therapist right now. Catherine Hummerkhaus will be very pleased with me. But it's what you do when that fear arises that really determines your character or where you're grounded inside. If you lash out in anger, you're outside of, of, of what, what God wants. So in this place where we're seeing culture begin to try to control the narrative of society and also the church, oh, it's fearful. I, I, as a pastor, have wondered, like, man, what's it going to look like in 10 years for me? What are my kids going to be raised in? What's society going to be like? It's fearful for me. Yet, despite the greatness of the threat of fear, we have to do something. We have to turn our gaze upward. We have to understand that God is greater still. Amen. He will win. And if we will stay with him, guess what? We are guaranteed victory also. So Jude is this book of warning. But it closes with something so powerful, which is the supreme confidence that we can have in God. So should dangerous times allow us to be angry or fearful? No. They should make us trust in a mighty and a powerful God. I'll, can we all stand tonight? I want to read the last two verses of the book of Jude. I think I've been saying James all night long when I've been trying to say Jude. Have I? No? I've been doing good? Okay. So, uh, if we have those last two verses, verse 24, can you put that on the screen? We're, I want us to all read this together. Here we go. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. <laughs> Guys, you just read a whole book of the Bible tonight. How about that? Here's the one to remind you, contend for your faith. It's valuable. It's worth defending. It's worth knowing. It's worth studying. Realize we're all on a journey of grace. That grace doesn't allow us to sit back and remain in our sin, but that grace draws us closer to Jesus. And any message of a sloppy and an irresponsible grace is a false teaching. Call it out for what it is. Know it for what it is. Contend for the faith and hold on to it. But in spite of it all, Put your trust in God. Amen. Can I pray for you tonight? God, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for your word. 
that is so real and alive for us today. It is truly a masterpiece that you inspired, written thousands of years ago, but just alive and active for us today. God, I pray for all of us here, Lord, that we would have the tenacity to contend for the faith. God, that we would defend it, Lord, that we would honor it, that we would value it. God, that we recognize and we thank you that you are a God of grace, but you're also a God that calls us to higher standards as followers of you. So God, wherever we are in our journeys, if, if, we're, if we're veterans and if we're running our race strong and hard and fast, if we're somewhere in the middle struggling with back and forth, or if we're brand new and it just feels like a crawl every day, God, we thank you for grace for the journey. God, but I just pray that all of us, whatever stage in our journey, whatever uh, speed in our journey, wherever we are, God, Lord, let us walk as a community dedicated to being more like you, set apart, wholly pleasing unto you, God. Lord, and when we're faced with the fear of the uncertainties of all the things happening in our culture that seem to be converging upon our faith, God, let us have the supreme confidence in who you are, God. Lord, that you are mighty, that you are greater still above it all. Lord, we worship you, we praise you, we give you glory. And I pray as we leave here tonight, Lord, give us opportunities the rest of this week to share your goodness, God to share our story of what you've done in us, to invite someone else along into this journey. God, I pray, Lord, that you would keep everyone safe. I pray for families. I pray for marriages. I pray for finances because we know you're a provider, you're a healer, you're a restorer, you're a redeemer. God, we love you so much. Thank you for your word. Thank you for being with us tonight. In your name we pray. Everybody said amen, amen.